Well, Doc, this is this is big for us. This is really great. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. How have you been? I mean, what just for first and foremost, what what has Dwight Gooden been up to recently? Everything is great. You know, um, living in Jersey, still a baseball fan. Come to City Field as much as I can. Uh, I have my kids living with me now, I'm with my three sons. Um, doing stuff with the Hike and Psych Medical Center. We're trying to um, build a wing there where kids that are, like teenage kids mostly that have addiction problems, they don't have insurance, they can still get the help they need. So we're trying to figure that out and figure a way to help them and get them off the streets. That's one of the big projects we got going now. Um, other than that, just enjoy my grandkids and, and kids. What memories come flooding back when you're back here in Queens and, and seeing the Mets fans and kind of going back in time a little bit? Well, it's a lot of fun to come to the ballpark because as, as a player, everything is rushed. You know, you can sign a graph, you take a pitch, you got to go. Now coming back as a fan, you get to reminisce of certain games they remember watching, uh, take pictures, enjoy the ballpark, um, enjoy some old teammates. Um, when I'm here, I always go up and see Keith and Ronnie and those guys, mm -hmm. as well as the Will Ponds and even a lot of the old media guys that was here when I first started. Just talking with those guys and talking baseball, being around the young players, and just sharing your knowledge. Like yesterday, I got to sp spend some time in the dugout and just introduce myself to the guys because I'm still a huge fan. And uh, mm -hmm. I enjoy coming to the ballpark. Even when I'm home, I got it on SNY or the Yes Network watching the games. Is there, uh, is there any player you said you were in the dugout with, with some of the young guys here talking to them? Any one that you sought out to talk to about any particular thing? Um, most of the guys, well, obviously Peter Alonso is the hottest guy now, but actually um, I go down to spring training with a group of friends of mine that's from New Jersey and meet the guys. And um, I met Peter, found out he was from Tampa. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to Plant High School. He was at Robert High School at that time because I went to Hillsborough High School. And so when I saw him yesterday, just talking to him, told him to keep going. You know, you can go through ups and downs, but uh, enjoy what he's doing. Yeah, he's, he's, been, stay right there. he's been pretty impressive. So he far. has been. He had a big rookie year. That kind of sounds good like <laughs> year sounds for you. Right. Amazing. He's an amazing player, man. They yeah. say those guys from Tampa can hit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you came up striking all those guys out down there in Tampa. You know, I knew at a young age you started playing. You were seven years old when you learned your curveball. You know, how did your dad kind of influence your love for the sport? My dad was... Um, a big fan of baseball. Uh, growing up in Tampa, we had the Cincinnati Reds who had spring training down there. So a lot of the spring training games, a lot of the eight ball team they play will go to the games. And I remember like since I was probably about seven, eight years old, watching games with my dad. Back then, they only had the one game a week on Saturdays with uh, Joe Gagnola. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of the Braves games on the radio because it was right there in Atlanta. So every Saturday, my dad would have his beer and chips, uh, and my cookies and juice, whatever, and watch the games. and. He's always asked me questions about the game. I didn't know he was quizzing me. I just thought he was talking baseball, mm -hmm. but uh, he was teaching me. And I remember when I got about 10 years old, he asked me how much I loved the game. I said, I loved the game of baseball. I was playing a little late, so he said, okay. Every day I get home from work, we'll go to the park and we'll work on some things. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, 10 years old, you go to the park. You want to take your glove, your ball, and your bat. But we went there with no equipment. Um, my nephew, Jerry Sheffield, we grew up in the same house. He's my sister's son. So we went there, and the only thing I regret is not asking my dad before he passed away was, where did he get his knowledge from from the game? Because it's like he knew I was going to be the pitcher and Gary was going to be a hitter. He told us we had me doing all these different drills. At that time, being 10 years old, you don't quite understand what he's teaching you. But as you get older, it all starts coming together that if your arm is not in the right place, you're not going to be able to get the ball where you want it. Um, so it started to click. So when I got like 12, 13, I was way advanced in kids my age. And I think it really helped me along the way. And once I was fortunate enough to make it to the majors at 19, I wasn't as intimidated as most 19 olds would be because my dad already taught me mm -hmm. the fundamentals of the game and pitching and don't pay attention to the names on the back of the jersey and so on. And it really helped influence me a lot. But to your question, my dad, baseball, it started off what I was doing was his dream and it became my dream. You know, you say that you wished you asked your father before he passed away, um, you know, uh, where he got his knowledge of the game from. But do you think he knew from that age of 10 when he asked you the question about how much you love the game that this was a special kid that had the skills to go that far or was he just kind of trying to you know bring a passion of his to you and and see where it goes great question i think it's a combination of both and i said because i had three older brothers that played little league baseball actually two of my brothers played with ray knight in georgia really it just never panned out and he probably thought a kid that even like on saturdays when we have school you know, I'll eat my cereals, and most kids were watching cartoons, but I'd be outside in the yard, whether it was a can or a ball, throwing the ball up, hitting it, or throwing the ball to the house, unfortunately breaking windows at times. <laughs> so he knew I was either crazy about baseball or there was something there. And he wanted to just challenge me and take it to the next level. And 
when I was sitting and watching games with him, and I don't re quite remember, but my parents would tell me that a lot of questions he would ask me about, what would you throw here? Why would you throw this in a situation that I was pretty much on with that? So I guess I was blessed with the baseball talent at a young age, and my dad just took it to another level. You know, the draft process has changed a lot just in the last 10 years, let alone, you know, 37 years ago when you got drafted by the Mets. What was it like, and, and when did it start to come about that there was interest there and that you'd be a first-round pick? Wow. Um, you know, growing up in Tampa, you played baseball during that time, like year-round. So there's a lot of talent, a lot of guys come out of the area. The high school I went to, Hillsborough High School, was known for baseball at that time because we had this thing called ROTC. So if you don't live in the area, uh, they can recruit you, put you in ROTC, and I made you eligible to play. Um, back then, it was no freshman. It was just 10th, 11th, 12th. And the school was so loaded with talent where the sophomore year, you basically on a team, but you didn't really get to play. So I always thought that I should be starting, so I ended up quitting the team. And then I remember my junior year with a guy, Floyd Yeomans, who was traded in the Gary Carter deal. We had Floyd Yeomans, a guy, Albert Everett, who's Carl Everett's older brother. We had Scott Vance Lovelace, who was drafted number one by the uh, Cubs the year before me in 81. And we played three games a week, so those guys were starting pitchers. I was a relief pitcher and outfielder. So I, I felt I had talent, but I didn't know if I was good enough to be drafted at that time. I wanted to be a hitter, actually. And what else is there? It seems like everybody, every, every pitcher, pitcher wants to be a hitter, right? Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, Floyd Yeomans got kicked off the team halfway through the season for missing practice, and I got to get in his spot and start starting. I ended up that year going 7-0, and and then they had this tournament down there, Tony Salentino tournament. I won MVP of that tournament. And the scouts started coming around. I started getting letters from different colleges. At that point, I figured, wow, I got a chance now. But up until my junior year, I didn't really know if I had a chance or not because I wasn't really playing that much at, at the high school level. What is that switch in mindset when you know that it's real now? Is there a change in mindset, or is it pretty much just the same work? It's definitely a change in mindset. Um, I was, not that I didn't work hard and love the game, but now – once you get the letters from different schools, uh, the scouts start coming around, getting you out of class. They, they, they have me run at 60, they have me hit, they have to go to the pitcher's mouth. Mm -hmm. They have you throw, so you, then you know there's interest there. When the scouts start coming around, I guess halfway through my junior year and then all of my senior year, saying, if you're available, when we pick, we're going to draft you. Now you know it's real. So the days you normally go home and do your homework and, I don't know, get on the phone or what have you, now you're in the backyard doing drills, you're asking questions. Uh, with my dad or guys that play semi-pro my dad's team to prepare yourself and obviously the nerve factor you get nervous because yeah. this is a dream you want but then also you don't know if you're quite good enough because you've never been in that situation and then you're aware of that i could do some things but i do get drafted to help my family um it was a middle class family so um all that stuff going through your mind until the draft day actually comes mm -hmm. and i remember um my high school coach telling me that i probably go between the fifth and tenth round <laughs> So I signed a letter of intent at the <laughs> University of Miami, and it's myself, uh, Lance McCullough Sr., uh -huh. and the guy Richard Montioni. It was all down at the Tampa Tribune at the uh, station in Tampa watching the draft go across. Totally different than what they, how they do it now at the MLB Network, uh -huh. but for the local paper, it was fun. So we're down there watching the draft, and those guys were really hired me. So you see Sean Johnson goes number one to the Cubs. Then the, I forget who went between that, but the fifth pick, New York Mets select Dwight Gooden. Know, Tampa, Florida. So I remember seeing that, and I had the guy <laughs> tell me at the time. I said, "Oh, is that right?" He said, "Yes, yeah, right." I said, "Is there any way you can call New York to make sure that's right?" Because it's like I'm based on what my high school coach told me. And he said, "We don't have to call. That's right." I said, well, "Just call New York and make sure." So he called New York. I don't know who he talked to here. He said, "Yes, you're the number one pick yeah. by the Mets." There and wasn't I, another Dwight Gooden in Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Uh, I was very excited. I had drove my dad car that day, and I was so excited where a friend of mine had to drive me home. And I remember when we got back home, there's all these media trucks in my neighborhood. And in my neighborhood, it was normally it was just a quiet neighborhood, one much, but now you got all these media trucks there. All the neighbors are out trying to figure out what's going on. It was just, I mean, I was overwhelmed by it because now I'm really living the dream that I always wanted to do as a kid. It was June of 82 when you get drafted, and then. April 84, you're in the big leagues. You make the opening day roster. You're in the rotation. You know, was did you feel like that there was any rush there? Were you surprised that you went from high A in 83 to the big leagues in 84? It happened pretty quick. I mean, um, like you say, 82, you get drafted. I, I started uh, in Kingsport, Tennessee. I was 5-4. and four, Then I went to, um, I called it the Little Falls. And then the next year, my first full year, in the spring training, you go to high A. At that time, it was in Lynchburg, Virginia. And I remember starting out 0-3. And I remember them talking, saying they could probably send me down. Or, and then we had this pitching coach, John Cumberland. I don't know if you guys remember him. Mm -hmm. He was my pitching coach. He said, no, you're not going to send him down. Let's have him miss a start. I'm going to work with him. 
So we didn't really work on anything. He just talked about pitching inside because in high school I hit a kid in the head and the paramedics came on the field and took him off the field. So from that point I was always afraid to pitch inside. So he said, this is what I'm going to do. The next start is to start moving on, you know, pitch inside. See, if a guy hits the ball hard off you, the next guy wants you to knock him down. If a guy hits a home run off of you, the next guy you drill him. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So that's okay. So after about five or six starts, I said, okay, that's enough. No more knocking guys down, no more hitting guys. But after starting 0 and 3, I ended up going 19 and 4 with 300 strikeouts. And I never seen that coming. And it took probably until I got to like eight or nine wins, but I finally started to get the confidence and belief that I can pitch at that level. And after every start, after 10 wins, they would say, okay, you got one more start, you're going to double A. One more start, you're going to double A. So that never happened. I remember once we clinched at Lynchburg, we was having a party at some pizza joint, and Sam Plaza, who was the manager, came in and said, you're going to triple A. I, I was like, okay, I was happy, but then at the same time, I'm like, I've been here a whole year, I want to stay here now yeah. with this uh, team. Yeah. He said, no, you, you don't have any say so, you have to go to triple A. So I had to drive to Norfolk. David Johnson was the manager. So he said, welcome to the club. And it was funny that when I was in uh, Kingsport, I didn't remember David, but David was like a roving instructor. instructor. Okay. Yes, and he said that he remembered me throwing a, a side a bullpen, and he was asking me, let me see you throw it down the way. Let me see you go up in. Let me see you curveball down the way. He said everything he was asking me to do, I was doing it. And not to blow smoke up my own horn, but he said he never seen a 17 year old do that. Mm. So he had that in his doubt, I mean, in the back of his mind. So when I got called to AAA, he, even though it was a year prior to that, he had seen what I can do. So I pitched the championship game in the playoffs and then the World Series final. And Louisville, I pitched that game and we won. And he goes, Next year, wherever I manage, you're on my team. <laughs> so I'm thinking, wow, at least I'll be in AAA. Right. <laughs> and George Bamberger, I think, resigned. Yeah. Davey got the job. And it's like November of 83, so I'm in the instruction league in St. Petersburg. And Davey's there. And so I just joke on. I said, Davey, remember what you told me? He goes, oh, don't worry. You're going to be in camp. <laughs> so I remember getting the call. I think it was, um, I would say it was either early February or late January. He invited to big league camp. At the time, I was living in Tampa, and we trained in St. Petersburg, which is basically right across the bridge. Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, this is amazing. And went from spring training, the whole time in spring training, I pitched a lot of B games they had back then. And Dave said, just throw the ball away, no, you keep it throwing, don't worry, you're going to be the fifth starter. So I said, okay. But then the whole time, the media kept saying, the front office said, you're probably going to double A or triple A, because I guess Tim Leary had entered himself prior to that, I don't know if it was 81, 82. When they brought him up at a young age, and they didn't want to risk the same thing. So I said, David, he keeps on going double A, triple A. I said, don't worry, you're going to make the team. <laughs> the last day of camp is when he told me I made the team. And once I finally made the team, I called my dad, told him I was making the team. And then at that point, you're happy to make it. But then, again, the doubt started coming in. Am I ready? I'm getting ready to face these guys who just two years ago I was in the backyard pretending to be. You know, Mike Schmidt, Dale Murphy, Pete Rose, all these guys. And now I'm getting ready to face these guys. So like you said, from going from high school in 82 to big season 84, happened very, very fast. And when I was able to not pay attention to the names on the back of the jersey, that's when I think success started. How, uh, how long did that take? I mean, obviously you had an incredible rookie season, you win rookie of the year, but you know, you're not just a rookie coming in at 19 years old. You're also part of this new hope, this rebuild. How difficult was it to not be in your own head about that, not be in your own head about the guys you were facing. How long did that whole process take? It took a while. I think um, I give a lot of credit to Mike Torres. Uh, Mike Torres is a guy, I remember him telling me, he said, I probably, he said him, I think it was uh, Craig Swan, and I want to say Dick Tidrell. He said, we're probably not going to be around here that much longer if you, Ron Darlin, say Fernandez, you got to start pitching well, they're probably going to get rid of us. But he said, as long as I'm here, the days that I'm not pitching and you're not pitching, you're going to sit next to me and we're going to study these interviews and we're going to talk baseball. I said, cool. I thought that was very impressive with a guy knowing he's about to lose his job. And so I remember my first big league start in Houston. My parents was there at the game. I won. I went five innings, won the game. And I remember after the game, my dad said, son, what do you think? I said, I should have won a lot of games, I think. My next start was in Chicago. <laughs> I got knocked out the third inning. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, son, what do you think? Now, I said, I don't know if I'm ready. <laughs> so just for the two games, you had the doubt. But Mike Torres was a big influence right at that point, and uh, Keith Hernandez as well, talking to me. He, will, he was like a pitching coach on the field because certain situations, Keith would come out to the mound and talk to me. But Mike Torres on the road, we'd go out to eat together at the ballpark. If he wasn't pitching or if I wasn't pitching, I sat next to him and we'd talk. It was, so I would say probably not until probably the All-Star break when I made the All-Star team, but I really felt that I had the confidence that I belonged in the big leagues at that time.
What was that game like? You were the youngest all-star of all time. You go in, you strike out the side, you're mowing through the American League now. Was there was there a whirlwind just to be announced as an all-star and to have the success you did in your in your first all-star game? That was incredible because first, you know, you, you go from making a team as a non-roster, you're playing against guys that you analyze. I mean, because I was always a baseball fan, and now you make the all-star team. I'm in the clubhouse with Nolan Ryan, um, you know, Pete Rose, Steve Barber, all these guys, Mike Schmidt, Dale Murphy, I can go on and on. And now, you're down to Brooklyn warming up, I got interviewed by Howard Cosell. I mean, all this stuff <laughs> is great. I mean, my thing was, I didn't really care if I got in the game or not, I just couldn't wait to get home and call my friends to tell them all the guys that I was around. But then when they call your name, they dock you up. I mean, your knees start buckling. I was more nervous playing an All-Star game than my first start. Is that right? Yes, because now you know, it's national TV, and you're playing against All-Stars. You know, on the other side, you got George Brett and Reggie Jackson, you got Dave Winfield. I mean, you got these guys <laughs> that hadn't faced you. I mean, you don't want to screw up because you had All-Stars on your team and then national TV. You try to think that it's a game, you're not aware of the TV, mm -hmm. but as a player, you're aware of all that, especially the young guy. <laughs> so I'm warming up, and then it's almost like you want to get in the game, but you really don't want to get in the game. <laughs> so do I remember, you, you I remember? made it. That's what yeah, that right. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So I remember Fernando was in, and he struck out three guys. Oh. And then they called down and they said, good, you're in next inning. I'm like, wow. But one of the things that really helped me, oh. I went to the mound, up with Gary Carter, who was my catcher, and also again, he came to the mound, he said, Doc, just relax, just throw the ball like you did the first half of the season against us, you'll be fine. And I was fortunate enough to get the three strikeouts. Then Gary said, wouldn't this be nice to do a fifth day, not knowing what's going to trade for Gary. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Did you, when, when you found out about that trade, having had that experience with Gary, what was your initial reaction? Initially, I was happy to get Gary. Then they told me the guys involved, like Floyd Yeomans, who was a guy, we played Little League together, played high school together, and he obviously got killed team. We had already, we played um, rookie ball together in Kingsport, so we always talked about being teammates. When I heard it was in the trade, also, it was kind of bittersweet at first because my personal feeling was I want to play with Yeomans, but then I'm getting an all-star catch with Gary. And once when the training started, I got to know Gary. I was working together. I mean, he was awesome. It was no, I mean, it was no reason why he wasn't a big part of the 85 season I had. He was the, one of the main reasons for that success I had in 85 because of Gary. You know, 1985 is still probably the best pitching season baseball's had since the mound was lowered after the 1968 season. And your run at the end of the year is ridiculous. You throw five complete games in your last six starts. You give up two runs and 53 innings. I mean, just uh, crazy video game numbers at the end of that season. What clicked in 85 to make that such a special year? I think one of the things was from the experience I got in 84, um, facing those guys and then having Gary Carter, all-star catcher. Gary's a very fair guy. I mean, he's um, a Christian guy, obviously, very quiet always smiling, but between the lines, he was as hard-nosed as anybody. And one of the things, he wanted the best out of me, it didn't matter if the score was 10 nothing or one nothing. He wanted me to pitch because it was one nothing. He wanted the 10 strikeouts, he wanted to shut out, he wanted me to totally dominate. And if I wasn't making certain pitches or he felt that I wasn't really pitching the seventh, eighth guy like I would the third or fourth hitters, Gary would come out there and get in your face, or he'll fire the ball back at you, he wanted to go. So, and sometimes certain pitches, he put down a sign and he'd give you the fist. He wanted, I mean, he was a, very exciting catcher to have. And for me, I was still developing. I was still getting stronger, learning the hitter. I mean, learning the hitters in the league. And um, I had a lot of confidence. And I still had Keith right there helping me with certain hitters and situations. Everything was right there with the veterans. And obviously, you Mel know, Stoudemire is my pitching coach. I can ask for a better situation to be in. What was it like from your perspective during Doc Mania in those years? I mean, that, that was the place to be. Shea Stadium every fifth day. It was all about you, all eyes on you. The atmosphere was incredible. To be the center of attention, what was that like? Oh, it was amazing. And the thing was, was I always had respect for the hitters, the opposing hitters, but it was almost like, I guess the best way I can describe that, was like, you, you're out pitching, but you're performing. It's like an entertainer. It's like being in concert. Um, not that you, you were blowing smoke, but you knew when you took the out of Shea in 85, I was the guy. The extra people, it's not like I'm bragging, but trust me, I'm not. Don't worry, your numbers <laughs> speak for themselves. Yeah. You can talk about it. <laughs> uh, you're still Dwight Gooden. Yeah. <laughs> I still comfortable when you're talking myself in that way, but, sure. you know, but you knew if, if there was, it was more people in the stands, there was more media attention, they was there to see you. And they didn't want just, you know, a four to five ball game. They wanted their one nothing. They wanted ten strikeouts. They wanted their shutout. And I wanted that too. So when I took them out, it was like 
okay, it's a concert now. I mean, that's kind of the mindset I had. I wanted to totally dominate. Like, if we scored a couple runs early, I didn't care if we didn't score more runs. I just wanted to be out on the mound that night. Um, and the, the, the energy I got from the fans, like when I got two strikes on the battle, everybody's standing up, clapping, wanting to strike out. I mean, I couldn't thank each fan enough. I mean, it was just amazing feeling, amazing situation to be in. I accepted the challenge, and having Gary Carter as the catch was the right guy at the right time for that because we both felt like that. Let's go out there, not just win the game, let's, let's like put on the show. Mm-hmm. We want to totally dominate. And again, no disrespect to the other guys, but that's just the mindset that I had. Well, I've talked to Jay Horowitz before. I know you're spending a lot of time with Jay now doing the alumni thing, but he said that. You know, he, he wishes maybe he would have said no to some of the interview requests for you or protected you a little bit more from the fame that rushed in as still a young guy. I mean, 1985, what are you, 20 years old? I mean, you're still really, really young and dealing with the success and winning the World Series at age 21. Do you look back and, and think the fame maybe came in a little bit too quickly, rushed in too much? Um, I would have done it no other way for the baseball stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, the weird thing happened, I think it happens for a reason the way it happened. I was very advanced my age. I think um, growing up with my dad right there helped a lot, prepared me for that. Unfortunately, I made bad decisions, made bad choices for his surroundings that I was around myself with, the place I was going. But most of my problems happened in Tampa. That's what a lot of people understand. It wasn't necessarily in New York. It was always when I went back home, um, going back to the same places, same crowds, just trying to fit in with the same people, that things had changed now. Um, it's almost like you, you want your friends, if they're doing the same thing, they know that I'm the same guy, but technically you're not the same guy because if the lifestyle, what you're doing for a living now, has changed. But unfortunately, I kept going, putting myself back in those situations and got caught up in, in the bad habits. You know, Doc, you are someone that has always spoken so openly about the struggles that you had that you're mentioning right now. Why is that? Why, why have you always felt the need to not hide that part of your life and the things that you've gone through? I think the main thing is, is being accountable and, and taking responsibility for, for my actions, whether it's good or bad. And at one time when I was in denial of the addiction, I used to point fingers or justify, but by doing that, I was, it's like having a reservation to go back out and do the same thing and self-destruct. Um, until I got honest with myself, that's when things started getting better. And understanding that it was more of a sickness, not necessarily I was a bad guy trying to get I was a sick guy just trying to get better. And by being honest with myself, not only did I can help myself, but help others as well. And, you know, just try to live a day at a time. I'm, not, I'm still not perfect, but going to do the best we can each day. You, you said that a lot of it happened when you were home in Tampa. Do you think that some of the problems right when your career ended is because you didn't have baseball as an outlet anymore? I think that was a big part. I think um, a lot of times, like now, I try to share with, with young players that to try to be set up once you retire because you don't know when it's going to come. It could be an injury or it come to have something to fall back on to. I think that was a big part. I think when I retired in 2000, I was with the Yankees down in Tampa. I retired because I hurt my knee. A lot of people didn't know I hurt my knee. Um, playing catch with Mike Stanton, he wanted me to get down with a catcher <laughs> and do a change up or something. I twist my knee. And they told me it would take about three months to, after the surgery and the rehab. And it's crazy because I wasn't really in the program before it was going to meet and stuff like that. And the first thing that came to my mind was, well, if you retire, no more meetings. I mean, I'm sorry, no more tests. You're not going to be tested anymore. That's how the disease works. I mean, it comes at your weaknesses. And then it happened. And so I think when I retired at 35, I wasn't really ready to retire. And it was no coincidence if you look it up. It was three years in a row where, when March came around, I got in trouble with the police. Mm-hmm. Three straight March. And looking back at it now, as the cycle went, it was basically part of depression, part of the, the disease I had where I was missing a game and totally been out because I retired too soon, only because the disease told me no more testing, unfortunately. How do you look back on that 1986 season? Because for Mets fans and Mets history, it's one of, if not the best seasons they've ever had. For you, you performed really well. You won the World Series. But that is also the year where things started to spiral the wrong way in your off-the-field life as well. So how do you look back on that season? Man, 86 was a great year. Um, being 21 years old, winning the World Series in New York. At the time, I wasn't really aware of the things that was really going on because they hadn't, I guess, been to the World Series since 73 and hadn't won since 69. And here we are in New York, young guy. I you know, went from rookie of the year to young World Series. And I remember that night when we clinched right here against the Red Sox of going in celebrating my team, calling my dad, and unfortunately, the next call went to a drug dealer. And 
So it went from a great night to a sad night because I ended up missing the parade the next day. But now when I look back at it, I said, wow, it really was a situation where it's something to celebrate even now because I think, unfortunately, something that was great then it turned sad. But then by me going through that, and again, I'm not justifying anything because still to talk about certain things about that is embarrassing. But because of the things I went through, post addiction and stuff, I think it was, from what they tell me, it was able to help others that was going through that. Unfortunately, it took that night. I mean, that should have been the best night of my life, really, at that time. It should have enjoyed it, but it turned into some tragedy, basically. Well, it depends on who you ask, but if you look back 84 85 these two incredible seasons you still had success as you went along in your big league career you're still a good pitcher you went to all-star games but why do you think that you never were able to replicate what you did in 84 and 85 after that I think part of it um, when I really look back at it, analyze it I mean a lot of different things first thing they say was well if you didn't have the, the drug problems the drug issues probably been a Hall of Fame pitcher or mm. career could have went farther um, and a lot of times I just look back at that and beat myself up about that. But then when I look, really look at it, I think it was a combination of my off the field problems and probably now looking at it the way they do the elements, probably the wear and tear. For, I had a lot of innings, a lot of pitches, I mean, in the minor leagues. But as, a, as an athlete, it's hard to say it's, it's because of, it was overworked because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done that no other way. I always wanted to you know, finish the games I started and all the games that I pitched, the numbers I had, I still want to do it. But it's kind of like my career years happened my first two years, 84, 85. And normally, a year like 85 normally wouldn't happen until I was maybe 28, 29, mm -hmm. because I came with 19 normally. And one thing I was talking about to DeGrom about, um, the year he had last year, this year, and moving forward, unfortunately, everything would be compared to the numbers he had last year. And one of the things I tell him, don't let it happen, that I let happen was I lost the love of the game in 86 because I was trying to match 85. Mm -hmm. I remember a game against, I want to say Fernando, I beat him 3 nothing. Complete game, I only had five stri uh, strikeouts. The first question was, what happened? You only had five strikeouts. <laughs> so, so the next night, I was trying to get 10 strikeouts instead of trying to get the win. And I actually lost the fun of the game for a while. I came back, but I lost the fun. So that's some of the stuff I tried to share with him. But to your question, I just think that my career, unfortunately, happened in 85 and you had thought that, not that I could have matched 85, but I could have came close again. I had decent years out there, but nothing never came close to that 85. And I think a lot of times I was trying to duplicate 85, even though I wouldn't admit that to you guys. But in the back of my mind, like once you've re reached a certain level as an athlete, even you're trying to get back there. You might not admit it, mm -hmm. but that's what I was trying to do. So already there's numbers that I probably could never match again because it happened so soon. Somebody told me you were, because you were obviously just a teenager, early 20s, you were rail thin at the beginning of your career. Just your natural filling <coughs> out that maybe you lost some of that whip that you had just from being as thin as you were, you were able to whip the ball and have the curveball the way you had it. Do you think it had anything to do with that? Um, that's a good question. Um, <coughs> Mike McCannick, <coughs> it changed some. Like I said, my, yeah. my physique changed some. Right. It changed a lot now. <laughs> 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 but uh, it changed some. I think it was a combination of my off the field problems, the wear and tear, a lot of innings early on. I think they said something, they did a study, like my first five years I had more innings. The next guy had like 700 less <laughs> pitches or innings or something like that yeah. than what I had, like for his Clemens, Pedro right. Martin, those guys. I think that played a part and just, um, just a combination of things. I couldn't put yeah. my finger on just one thing. Right. You know, I'm glad you mentioned the DeGrom thing because it's a question that we've asked him and I was I was actually going to go there with you to, to ask you about just that pressure of having a near perfect season and then coming back the year later where, you know, in reality, it's almost impossible to do that again. Um, DeGrom says all the right things now and he says, you know, he, he understands that and tries to put that out of his mind. But in that moment, did you know what you were trying to do or was it something looking back on it where you said you know i probably put more pressure on myself than is necessary looking back at it you're worried because when you're in that moment like say 85 see the way everything happened it's like, like every game i was totally locked in mm -hmm. i could throw any pitch at any time wherever i wanted um 86 it was a good game but then you're trying to match that i mean you're aware, like, I'm a, I'm a fan, I was a fan then, so I'm watching the news, I'm reading the papers, mm -hmm. and plus in my own head, I'm trying to get back there to where I was, because honestly, it's a great feeling, it's a great place to be, yeah. and you want to be that guy. But in all reality, it's hard to accept that, hey, okay, I might win 
four two is okay. It's okay, but to you it's not because you've been at that level, yeah. and it's hard to accept anything under that. Um, so with Degrom, he's probably I mean he's older. What Degrom's thirty thirty one, yeah. and at that time I was twenty one coming off the year I had it twenty. So he's probably can accept that a lot better than I can at this age because he's older. Hopefully he can and still enjoy pitching because he's still a great pitcher. No, no doubt about it. You know, being around this team, you guys were the last ones to win a championship, so it's still etched in everything we see, uh, even now. Y you and Keith and, and Ronnie Darling and, and Daryl in Mets uniforms. But then 10 years later, after the World Series, you and Daryl are with the Yankees, and you look at those <laughs> pictures, yeah. it's bizarre. It's <laughs> weird to see Doc and Daryl in Yankees uniforms. Are we allowed to mention this on this podcast, yeah, by I, the way? With I, this, yeah, I think we to. can, but <laughs> because it's just so bizarre. And Mel Stottlemyre was your pitching coach again with the Yankees. So all of this is replaying on the other side of town. Was there any regret to throwing a world to winning a World Series or to throwing a no-hitter in a Yankees uniform? Was there any party who was like, man, I wish I could have done that with the Mets again? Well, that's a great question. And then I'm going to say, Phil, you asked me that question. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, I think everything happened the way it's supposed to happen. Huh. Um, I'm always a good man at heart, always, no matter what. I'm a man. I think that the way things happen, the Mets want to cut ties after '94. And I understand. I completely get it. I wanted to come back because I wanted to make things right with the fans. I didn't want to leave. The Mets only know that I left for this getting suspended from baseball. But I understood what the Mets were going to do. I was very fortunate enough to, for the Steinbrenner family, an opportunity to continue my career in New York. I wanted to stay in New York. Um, but it was weird. It was weird, you know, when the Yankee pitch stripes. And I remember the first day I put the uniform on in Tampa, I was in the mirror for probably an hour. So I was looking because when you're met, you actually hate the Yankees. Not, not literally hate the Yankees, but you hate the Yankees. But now, I win the Yankees pitch strike. But to win the World Series there in 96, and the pitcher no hitter with the Yankees, you would have thought that it would happen in 85, 84. Um, but I think it was just meant to be, excuse me, <coughs> the way it happened in 96 because. Again, my dad taught me the game of baseball. The day I pitched a no hitter, I was supposed to be home to build my dad. You know, he, was ha he had been on Dallas for 15 years. He was having open heart surgery the following day, and they thought because of his health reasons, he wouldn't make it through. And I thought he would probably want me to pitch. And that day turned out to be a no hitter, so I think the way everything played out was supposed to be, and it turned out that was the last game he see me pitch. And then what was even weirder, like you say, winning World Series with the Mets, I mean, the Yankees in 96 was yeah. when we had the 30th anniversary. <laughs> with the Yankees a couple years, I mean with the Mets a couple years ago. Three weeks later we was having a 20 anniversary <laughs> with the Yankees. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was very strange <laughs> being in both places. But um, yeah. it just the way it happened. I was just very, very happy to get the opportunity to play in New York and win a World Series with both New York teams. But I'm always going to be a Met. Can you describe what that moment was like throwing a no-hitter? Not just the fact that it was a no-hitter, but like you were talking about, everything going on with your dad. Is it possible to take us into those emotions in that moment? The best, the best way I can. Um, like I said, that night, the way everything happened, because I remember I already had the plan to get to fly home. And that, that morning, I just thought that he would probably want me to pitch. And <clears throat> in my mind, I was replaying all the times when I was a kid, you know, teaching me these drills, talking to me about baseball, talking to me about work comes first, family comes first, take care of responsibility. All this stuff was playing in my tape. It was like being a kid again and hearing his voice. The other part was like, man, is he gonna pull through that shot? Go home, is that be with him? What's more important? And I remember calling Joe Torrey, who was the manager at the time, telling him that I'm coming in tonight, I'm going to pitch. He said, no, go be with your dad, take as much time you need. When you're ready, come back. I said, no, I'll see you tonight. Then I called my mom. She didn't take it the same way. Actually, I felt bad because I had to end up hanging up the phone because she was like, no, you should be with your dad. You know, he's not doing well, we don't know if he's gonna pull through. And I said, mom, I think I'm gonna pitch. And I ended up hanging the phone up. And the whole day just felt strange driving to the ballpark. Um, I remember the first three innings of that game, standing in the walkway between the dugout and the clubhouse, wondering if I made the right decision or not. And whatever sign Girardi put down the first minute, I just go with it. Not into the sixth inning, that's when I realized I had a no-hitter going, where you look at the scoreboard, you see no runs, no hits, no errors. Then you're able to totally lock in the game. And then we're playing Seattle, who in 1996, to me, had the best hit team in baseball at that time. And then, I said, okay, I'll probably not get no hitter, but let me just pitch to try to get the win. And I remember the ninth inning, we were up two to nothing. I walked two guys, and Mel Stoudemire comes out to the mound, and he goes, Doc, how are we doing? And I was, I was exhausted. I was tired. I said, Mel, it doesn't matter. I'm not coming out. I said, okay, it's your game. You turned around and walked out. 
And I remember the last pitch of the game I threw was a hanging curveball to Paul Sorrento. I mean, sitting on the tee, <laughs> and he popped it up. And I remember Jeter and Wade Boggs going for the ball, and I was <laughs> under my breath. I'm like, Jeter, let Jeter have it, let Jeter have it. <laughs> because the only reason I said that because Boggs always said he hated pop-ups. And the same the ball was taking forever to come down. And when Jeter caught it, the emotion that was going through my head was I went from being suspended the year before out of baseball, not knowing if I ever get the opportunity to play again. Um, is my dad going to be okay? Is he going to pull through? I'm back in New York doing this again. With all, I mean, this is honestly what's going through my head is they're carrying me off the field. Um, early that year, I started 0 3. I basically got benched. And when a pitcher gets benched, I mean, if you're up 10 nothing or you're down 10 nothing, you don't get in the game. I remember whispers, Doc's going to get released. Doc's going to get sunk down. They want to release me. Sideburns almost said, well, let's probably sit him down. Unfortunately, David Cohen got the aneurysm in his arm, and that's how I got back into the rotation. So all these things are going through your head is they're carrying you off the field. And you know, I'm pumping my hands, I'm pumping my fists, and the crowd's there cheering. And I remember about 14 months prior to that, I couldn't stay clean for one day, not knowing if you ever get the opportunity, and here you are being carried off Yankee Stadium. And that was all, you know, for the man above, no doubt about it. <clears throat> and to be in that situation, it's just, Mind blowing. I guess that's the best way I can explain yeah. advice. Yeah. For that. It's a real <coughs> experience that even just yeah, hearing it's, about it's it. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Another kind of emotional day you you probably had as a Yankee was at Shea Stadium against the Mets. Interleague play it started while you were with the Yankees, and you finally get to come back as a visitor to face the Mets at Shea Stadium. The next era of good Mets teams with Piazza and and all those guys that went to the World Series in 2000. What was it like to stand on the mound and see the Mets on the other side and, and face them at Shea Stadium? That was crazy. Um, <coughs> if I can take you back, I let you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I tell you in, in 94, well, 95, when I signed the Yankees, I wanted to come back to the Mets. I said, no, I think Steve Phillips might have been the general manager at the time. Mm -hmm. I said, no, okay. So, signed with the Yankees in 96, 97. Then 98, I went to Cleveland, but before I signed with Cleveland, I called the Mets again. Steve Phillips said no. So I signed with Cleveland in 98, 99. After 99, I called the Mets again. Steve Phillips said no. So I ended up signing with Houston. I had one start. This was in 2000. I had one start. I got traded to Tampa. I had eight starts and I got released. I called the Mets again. So I'm willing to go to AAA, whatever I got to do. I just want to come back one more time. Steve Phillips said no. So I sat home for a month. George Stamper called me and said, do you still want to play? I said, sure. He said, well, show up at the complex, work out with Billy Connors. If you don't work out, you come work with me. So I went over I worked out with the Yankees for like two weeks, threw a couple of games in the rookie ball, nothing special. And I remember the next day I came to the park, Bill said, Doc, I need to see you in the office. So I, I'm thinking I'm going to get released. And he said, um, they need a pitcher in New York. They're playing the Mets at Shea Stadium <laughs> <laughs> in the night game. They want you to pitch the day game against the Mets. I'm like, no way. <laughs> I, I wasn't ready. I couldn't say, no, I'm not ready. Yeah. Right. And I thought it was going to get bombed. Right. But I said, at least I get to go back to Shea that one last time. That's all I really wanted. Mm -hmm. Went back to Shea and I pitched well. But yeah. that was very strange. Taking a bus from Yankee Stadium to um, Shea Stadium, mm -hmm. warming up in the visitor's bullpen, coming and taking him out from the visitor's dugout. All that just, it didn't seem right. And warming up in the bullpen, I had nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. And luckily, I had Mel starting there again. Mel, was, he was there at the beginning and the end. And I'm warming up at Mel saying, Doc, try this. Then every four or five pitches, he said, Doc, try that. And they got to the point where he just was <laughs> silent. He didn't say nothing. <laughs> so you knew <laughs> Mel was like, there's nothing there. <laughs> and then as I'm walking down the tunnel today, I'll, all the relief pitches are coming to the bullpen where normally it may be like the lone guy or maybe one other guy, but the whole staff is coming down. So I know Mel called him and said, you guys get down here. It's not coming long. <laughs> Now, and this stuff is true, I can't make this up. When I get ready to take them out, Joe Torrey say, Doc, give me whatever you got, one inning, two innings, whatever. Normally, starting pitches say, okay, let's go, Doc. You don't say anything like, give me one or two innings. Right. <laughs> but for some reason, I took them out and warmed up, everything came together. I found my curveball, location was there. I don't know what it was, it was like being at home again. And they had some great hitters. I remember facing Piazza, they had uh, Derek Bell, who a guy I grew up with. I think um, Todd Zeal was on that team, uh, Robin Gutierrez, so they had some hitters. And I got through five minutes. I remember Tori said, how do you feel? I said, no, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, five minutes, I'm great. I said, and then to stay with the team the rest of the year and finish out. And then we played the Mets in the World Series. And my kids, some of my kids, like my older kids are Mets fans. My young kids are Yankee fans. But the older kids still had the Mets year on when we was playing it in the World Series. So uh, but once we won, I mean, it's, 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 it's just tremendous. Even though it was against the Mets, but as well. You know, you talk about Mel Stottlemyre, uh, the bookend of your career ends of your career. Uh, I've heard you mention him as almost like a second father to you. How much 
did he mean to your life and your career? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I was very fortunate to have him not only as a pitching coach, but as a mentor. And like I say, once I made the team, my dad taught me everything. I just got called my dad out there a game. Him and my dad had a great relationship. And on the road, Mel was good. He always come up my room sometimes. Doc, how you doing? How you feeling? If you're homesick, you know, call me and come by. And I remember when I, me and Mel really became close was in 94 I thought I went to, uh, I'm sorry, 87. I went to Smithers when I got out. Um, Dr. Allen Lance picked me up and Jay Horace. I went to Jay's house and Mel was there. That's the first time we really had a conversation about everything but baseball. He said, baseball's good, baseball's fun. Baseball's gonna be here when we're done. But friendship, fatherhood, that stuff lasts forever. And he said, I just want you to know, you mean more to me than a baseball pitcher. And that's when we really had a bond started at that point. And I said, I have him at the beginning and then at the end of my career, can ask for a better situation, not only as a, a great pitching coach, but as a friend and somebody I can trust and let him know how I'm really feeling. Like, like I told him when I took him out of May, I said, I'm nervous. First time I've been like, not scared, but just nervous, not knowing if I can really do this. Mm -hmm. Squad and enjoy. I said, whatever happens, just happens. And he was always fair to me. Like, when I was in Yankee, he said, we got to learn how to pitch. Now, where, I said, what do you mean, how to pitch? He goes, well, now everything's different. You don't have the 95, 96 anymore. You know, so we got to learn how to pitch. We got to study hitters more. Rely more on the you know, location. He was honest with me. Where most pitching coaches might have said, might, may have not been as honest, but he was always honest with me, and I respect that. And he's a guy that I miss all the time. I mean, he, he was a true friend and a father figure. I feel like we've come this far without really yeah. mentioning Daryl Strawberry too much. What's your relationship like with Daryl these days? Today is great. Yeah. Tomorrow, I don't know. <laughs> 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 no, Daryl's good. You know, um, we've had our problems, like, in the families, you have mm -hmm. a problem with you know, your brothers or what have you. Um, a lot of things happened, I guess, like three years ago that I didn't think was fair. We talked about it. You know, today, everything's good. We, we still talk now. Mm -hmm. We talk more on a, I say, a real conversation. What I mean by that is, you know, I call the drugs involved. We just talk straight man to man. I think we got closer since that happened. Um, and we, we still have different disagreements at times, but I know at the end of the day, I have his back and he has my back. So um, he's a guy that I love. And I can call a friend. Uh, listen, uh, Doc, we cannot thank you enough. Oh, my I mean, pleasure. This was no. absolutely fantastic. And, uh, and we just appreciate you spending so much time. Sure. And it's great seeing you again. It really it's always good to see you. Yeah. Definitely. All thank right. You I, know you, I know you got interviewed by Howard Cosell at uh, the 84 All-Star <laughs> Game. But, you know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this was <laughs> yeah, at least okay. okay. Same neighborhood. <laughs> Doc Gooden, thank, thank you so it. much. Right. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys.